This street is part of my personal history. I grew up here in the late 1950s and early 1960s as part of the baby boom generation. And this street was always full of kids. There was road hockey at the bottom of the hill. The girls would skip at the top. We were always having fun. But what we didn't realize is that we were growing up in the shadow of great events. This house over here was my introduction to the Second World War. This was my house. Actually, this looks nothing like my house. It was a simple bell top and what would be the right side of this building today, which is quite majestic. My room was the middle one and I shared it with one of my three evil sisters. The doorway was over here and I always remember the winter morning that I decided to put my tongue on the metal railing. Of course, I lost part of my tongue and learned a great lesson. In the summertime, we go to the backyard. That's where we buried our family hamsters. That's where we read our comic books. That's where we'd play, because that's all we ever did. I like to say my father told me great stories of the Second World War, but of course, like all World War II veterans, he kept his stories to himself. However, it was no big deal. Everybody's father was a Second World War veteran. So we would come out here, and in the winter time, of course, we'd come up, follow the hills of snow all the way to school. We'd play King of the Mountain. We would do all that sort of entertaining stuff. We played outdoor hockey, of course, totally outdoors, and all the kids would be crying at intermission because their feet would be frozen. But the real one was this hill. This hill was always my nemesis. And although today it's not really a slope, they must have changed it because in 1960, this was a huge hill. And I can remember going down here on roller skates, always wiping out. I remember playing British Bulldog along here. This was really the center of my universe, this hill. But the real challenge came when I learned to ride a bicycle, one of those oversized two-wheelers. And of course, I could balance myself on the bike, but I didn't know how to stop it. But nonetheless, I'd head off down the hill. I came down the hill at full speed, but of course I didn't know how to stop the bike. So being the genius I was, I found a low part in the curb, and I'd go up over that part of the curb onto this lawn over here. I'd throw the bike and throw myself off at the same time, and that's how I stopped. Some genius. So this house over here was my introduction to the First World War. This was my grandfather's house. You could say, for me, the Second World War was at the top of the hill and the First World War was around the corner. I still remember this place as a sanctuary, my super place for Halloween and also the peonies and the lilacs and all sorts of things about my grandfather. I like to say that he told me a lot about the First World War, but if the Second World War veterans were bad, the First World War veterans were even worse. They kept their secrets close to their heart. I would have loved to have sit down and talked to him about these things, but I didn't. I knew he was at Vimy, and I knew inside the house there was all sorts of things from the First World War, but I never really knew what they were. I used to sit with my grandfather on this step. There's still a photograph of us together. I remember he had a scar on his face. I remember there were silks on the wall, there was in Flanders fields up in the wall, but of course it had no meaning to me. He didn't tell me much. I knew he'd been in great events. I knew he'd been severely wounded. Vimy had come up, some tunnels, but I really didn't know his story. So the question is, how do you find the answers to questions you never asked? And there are three ways of doing it. 
One is to go back over the regimental histories and memoirs or any effects that he might have left behind. And my grandfather left a lot behind. The second is go on the internet, get the war diaries, and then look up other information on his service so you can piece a bit more together. And the third is to find somebody who knew him, someone he might have confided in, someone who might have told him something about the war. And for me, there's one place to go. We're gonna go back to Ottawa and talk to my grandfather's firstborn, Norm Christie Sr., my father. We've come to Ottawa to talk to my father to find out more about what my grandfather did in the First World War. I brought my son Lachlan along and it's to his generation I'll be passing my torch. Hi. Well, we're here to talk about the war. So what we're trying to do is put Granddad's story together about where he went in the First World War and ultimately make a pilgrimage to, to where he went, you know, all the different villages and towns and Vimy, of course. So what we're trying to do is piece the story together. What can you tell me, what did he tell you about the First World War and his experiences? Well, absolutely nothing. He never told, uh, he never told me anything about the First World War. Uh, I was... I was aware that he was in the army. Uh, I saw a number of things, but I, I didn't have any interest in them at all. And, I, and he never spoke about it. He never, he never, I never asked about them. I saw them, and he never spoke about them. Uh, what I know about my great-grandfather in the war was he was a stretcher bearer uh, who was at Vimy Ridge and uh, I actually, I don't, I can't remember what other battle he was at. But uh, I know he was at Vimy Ridge, and uh, he must have seen some pretty gruesome stuff being a stretcher bearer at uh, those battles. The only interest I had in the First World War was in his, uh, or I should say the, the original interest was in his books. I used to go and take his books out. He had a lot of large books with pictures and, uh, and uh, sketches, and there was one book in particular that had uh, this uh, allied prisoner. It was, I think it must have been a sketch. And uh, the, I remember this as a kid. His eyes had been poked out by the Germans in torture. So this was, and I used to go to that book all the time and I remember that vividly. When I was living in France growing up, uh, I got involved in the First and Second World War because well, basically there was farmer's fields everywhere and there was a fun thing to do is to go pick up remnants of uh, the wars, like shrapnel balls, bullets, uh, shell pieces, whatever, cartridges. And uh, that was really fun being uh, a young kid and also like playing around in the bunkers and stuff like that. And so like the war's all around me and uh, so that's how I got interested into it. In their own minds, they must have figured never again would they ever go through that type of thing that went, they went through in World War One, and they just buried it. They didn't talk about it. They didn't. Well, when when Second World War came and you signed up, then you think if he was, he would have said something to you. Did, and... I know I would have. Yeah, I would have suggested to think twice before you go in the army. Uh, and he didn't. I joined the army, and he was quite proud of that. There was no. He never warned me or. Talking to my father didn't really give us a great deal about what my grandfather did during the First World War. Now we're going to have to resort to other sources. Some of them are the regimental histories. And this is the regimental history of the number eight Canadian Field Ambulance. And this is the unit my grandfather belonged to. But these so will only take you so far. Often you have to use other types of artifacts. 
And First World War soldiers were very proud, and they had a tendency to keep things, even if they didn't talk about it. And my grandfather was no different. I have an assortment of his material right here. This is a photograph of my great uncle John and my grandfather taken in Montreal in 1915. So this gives you an outline of what they did. We also have his medals here, which he kept, you know, hidden somewhere in a box for years and years and years. There's the drivers of the number eight field ambulance. There's his medals and other artifacts, cap badges, shoulder flashes that he used during the war. This is his stretcher bearer armband that he would have wore as a driver in the field ambulance. You even have the picture here of the drivers. And there's my grandfather. This was taken in Fosse number 10 near Lens in 1917. But the real treasure trove are these. And these are his photo albums. We found them in a box after my uncle died and it's got all his photographs of his friends, the places they were were, and of course the postcards. And all of them have his writing on the back. So in his words, he describes the places he went to. And piecing all these things together, we should be able to piece together his entire route during the First World War. And of course, the route starts in Montreal. This is the Notre Dame de Grasse, or NDG sector of Montreal. And this is where my grandfather and my father grew up in the 1930s and 1940s. I'm sort of following in the steps of Christie's past. This house on the corner here was my grandfather's house, and it was here that my father used to cut the lawn, and this is where he grew up. And it's also where he signed up for the Second World War. This house was also where he had his wedding reception when he married my mother in 1944 before he went overseas. So this little corner of Montreal is really a piece of my family history. That this heart and mind embraces all day through. To follow precisely in my grandfather's footsteps, I've come back to Point St. Charles, which was the old Irish Scottish ghetto in Montreal. My grandfather's father came here in about 1880 from Scotland and he worked in the big rail yards that are just over to our left over here. And that's where they settled, and that's where my grandfather was born, and that's where his brother John was born. To go back to 1915, I'm going to have to cross the street, and we can go back into time, provided we don't get hit by a car. I'm sure my grandfather didn't have to endure this sort of traffic in 1915. I do know that he went to school in this area, this is where he lived his early part of his life. I know his brother John also went to school here, elementary school, no more. I know that he started work as a 16 year old as a clerk in the Bell Telephone Company of Canada. And I also know both John and Randall lived on this street, Congregation Street, in 1915. And this is when they enlisted in the Canadian Army. In 1915, after reading the casualty lists and watching their friends enlist, both brothers joined the Canadian Army. My grandfather joined the Canadian Army Medical Corps in August, and a few weeks later, John joined the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry through the Overseas Universities Company. And it was through this doorway they took their first steps to Tipperary. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Yeah. 